Okay, in this video, I'm going to continue on with my tutorials on electrostatics. This is video number 19, and I'm going to discuss the electric potential. Specifically, I'm going to show you two methods for calculating the electric potential. In this section, there are three videos previous to this which are relevant. In video 18, I discussed the curl of the electric field. We found that the curl of the electrostatic field is zero, but the curl of the electrodynamic field is non-zero. In videos 1 and 2, I discuss Coulomb's law and the electric field. Now in my section on vector calculus for electromagnetism, videos 44 and 45, I discussed and derived the Helmholtz theorem. The Helmholtz theorem underpins all of the theory for the electric potential, and also for the scalar, general scalar potential and vector potentials. So without the Helmholtz theorem, we don't have electric potential, without that, calculating the electric field is much more cumbersome. So in order to watch the rest of this video and understand it, I strongly suggest that you watch videos 44 and 45 on my section on vector calculus for electromagnetism. So we know from the Helmholtz theorem that any equation can be written as follows. We can have, we add minus the gradient of a scalar function V and the curl of a vector function W. And that can be made into any function whatsoever. Notice, of course, that we have this minus sign here. Okay, that's largely a matter of convention, and I wouldn't worry about it. So the function which underpins the Helmholtz theorem is the Dirac delta function. And I spent a lot of time and effort discussing this in my section on vector calculus for electromagnetism. So in electrostatics, we know that the curl of the electric field is zero. We also saw that when I was deriving the Helmholtz theorem, we derived this vector w as the following integral. It's over the primed coordinates, and we have the prime curl of e function of r prime d tau prime divided by the separation vector. Notice, of course, that in electrostatics, the curl of the electric field is zero. And this means that in electrostatics, this w function is zero. Now, going back up to to this equation here. If I'm trying to calculate the electric field, and in, in for the electric field W is equal to zero, that means the electric field only has minus the gradient of a scalar left over. So in only a few lines we find that the electric field is minus the gradient of a scalar. We, sc we call the scalar V a function of R the scalar potential. Note by the way that we're integrating over the unprimed, excuse me, the primed coordinates to calculate the value of the function at an unprimed coordinate. So, knowledge of the Helmholtz theorem makes life very easy. However, it's more common for beginners to use an alternative method to derive the, um, the electric field in terms of the scalar potential. So, if you look at Stokes' theorem, where we take the surface integral of the curl of a function, let's say v, and we, we dot that with dA, the infinitesimal surface element, that's equal to the closed path integral of v dot dL. But in electrostatics, we know, of course, that the electric field that the curl of the electric field is zero, which means the closed path integral of v dot dl is also zero. Now what happens if we don't take a closed path integral, instead we take an open integral? Let's say we go from zero to r. So it won't be zero, instead it'll, it'll have some finite value. I'm gonna say that it has a functional form of minus v of r. Note by the way, of course it's gonna be the same potential as we've seen over here, but that for the moment, we don't know that that is the case. So we also know that the particular integral, let's say e dot dl, is just, going to be, is just going to be equal to v evaluated at the limits. So let's say we take minus the integral from zero to b of e dot dl, and we add to that the integral of zero to a of e dot dl. Simply that's going to be equal to v evaluated b minus v evaluated a. Notice the order, by the way, is changed because of this minus sign. Now, if we swap the limits on the integral here, instead we get a minus sign instead of a plus sign. So we have minus the integral from 0 to b of e dot dl, minus the integral of a to 0 of e dot dl, and that's equal to minus the integral of a to b of e dot dl. Now, we saw a minute ago again that that's simply going to be v evaluated at b minus v evaluated at a. So why is this useful to us? Well, it's useful because if we look at the gradient, sorry, the fundamental theorem for gradients, so that's written here. 
So the fundamental theorem for gradients says if we integrate from zero to uh, from a to b of the gradient of a, of a scalar, let's call it t, and we integrate that dot dl, that's simply going to be the same as evaluating t at the, the limit b minus t at the limit a. So going back up to what we have, this means that if we compare the fundamental theorem for gradients with what we have, we have v evaluated b minus v evaluated a is in actual fact the integral from a to b of the gradient of the scalar potential v dot dl. Now, we also saw a moment ago that we have this is equal to minus a to b of e dot dl. So we can put the two together, and we see that the, the limits on the integral are, are equal. They're both integrated dot dl. That means the integrals are equal, which means that e it must be equal to minus the gradient of v. So this is the second way of calculating the, uh, the functional form of the electric field in terms of the scalar potential. Notice, by the way, it hinges on the gradient, th or excuse me, the fundamental theorem for gradients. So what we found in two different ways is that E is equal to minus the gradient of V. V is the scalar potential, and E is, of course, our vector electric potential. Now, how does this make life easier? Well, the new trick for calculating the electric field will no longer be to calculate it directly. Instead, we calculate the scalar potential, and we take the gradient of the scalar potential. Now, in my video on the Helmholtz theorem, I defined the scalar potential as follows. We had minus 1 over 4 pi, and we had the primed integral of the, the, the prime divergence of e of r prime d tau prime over the separation vector. We know, of course, from the theory of electrostatics that e is equal to minus the gradient of v, that the, the divergence of e is equal to rho over epsilon 0, and the curl of e is equal to 0 for electrostatic fields. Once again, notice, by the way, that when you integrate over the primed coordinates, you calculate the value at the unprimed coordinates. So currently, we're using the electric field to calculate the potential. But we really want the potential to be uh, able to calculate the electric field. So for the potential to be useful, we require it to calculate the electric field from the charge density. So going back here, just to show, we, we're calculating the scalar potential from the electric field. We really want the scalar potential to calculate the electric field. So in, in one respect, the integral is written the wrong way around. So let's write down what we know is the formula for the electric field. So the electric field is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, the integral of the charge density evaluated at r prime, the separation unit vector, integrated to tau prime, divided by the separation vector, or the magnitude of the separation vector. We also know that the electric field of a point charge is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, q over r squared r hat. So where do we go from here? Now we bring in the, the, uh, the scalar potential. So we, can, we know, of course, that E is equal to minus gradient of V, or using Stokes' theorem, we can rewrite it as V in terms of E. So V is minus the integral of E dot dl. Now I'm going to define the zero of the, electric pot uh, of the scalar potential as at infinity. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to try and integrate from infinity to R of E dot dl, minus E dot dl. But we know that e for a point charge is 1 over 4 pi q over r squared r hat. So we have the, the, we have the product here of r hat and dl, both vectors. Of course, this is going to be in the dr direction. And when we do the integral, we get rid of the minus sign because that goes away, and we're left at 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 q over r. What we're actually after calculating is the, the, the scalar potential for a point charge. But we know that the, oh, I can tell you, perhaps you don't know, that the scalar potential obeys the superposition principle. So that means if we want to calculate an arbitrary scalar potential, all we need to do is add up all the individual scalar potentials. So we take the sum over n, going from i is equal to 1 to n, q sub i divided by the magnitude of the separation vector sub i. Or, of course, we can put this in an integral form very easily, assuming we have a continuous charge distribution and we have the charge density rho of r prime d tau prime over the magnitude of the separation vector. All right, so now what we're after having, what we're after getting is the scalar potential written in terms 
of the uh, charge density. The reason this is useful is we often know what the charge density is in a, a, a lab laboratory or something like that. And that means we're very easily able to calculate the electric field by taking the gradient of this particular function. Now, just have one more thing to show you. So just a bit of an aside, Poisson's equation is a, very, is, is a very important equation in physics and mathematics. And it's when you take the Laplacian of a scalar function, let's say t, and that's equal to a constant. Let's say the constant in this case is b. Now if instead it's, the, it's equal to zero rather than a constant, we speak of Laplace's equation. So Laplace's equation is a simplified Poisson's equation. In videos 20 through to 33 on my subsection, excuse me, on my section on differential equations, I solved the Laplace's equation using the method of power series. Now you might be wondering why am I speaking about this? Well, you'll see in a moment. So we saw a moment ago that E is equal to minus the gradient of V. But we also know that if we take the divergence of the electric field, we get rho over epsilon zero. So what I'm going to do is plug in for the electric field in this particular formula here. So if we do that, simply what we get is that we take the the divergence of minus the gradient of v, which is of, of course going to be minus the Laplacian of v, is equal to rho over epsilon zero. Notice of course we have Poisson's equation. So you might say that the study of electrodynamics is perhaps very much related to Poisson's equation, or solving Poisson's equation. Now I can tell you, and you can just take this as a, as a given fact, that the general solution to this particular formula using the Dirac delta function is always the following. It's 1 over 4 pi, a constant times the integral of the sources integrated to tau prime divided by the magnitude of the separation vector. So if you ever get a formula that looks, or a function that looks something like this, you should know the answer immediately. You find out the sources, you work out the constant, and you have the answer. Now, of course, in many areas of physics, we solve this using power series instead. So you, you might get one solution to the answer using, we'll say, the direct delta function, and it would look completely different to the same answer, or to the same, uh, the solution to the same equation using power series. So in this particular case, we're able to very quickly find out the, the scalar potential, because we know that the sources are the, uh, the char well, we know the source is the, ch the charge density, and we know the constant is 1 over epsilon 0. Now, the last thing I need to say is that because in electrostatics we have no charge, no charge density, or we'll say there's an equal number of positive and negative charge, that means we're instead, instead of talking about Poisson's equation, we're talking about a Laplace's equation. So very often people will say that the study of electrostatics is the study of Laplace's equation. Because once you solve Laplace's equation, you're able to calculate the electric field uh, in electrostatics. So that's all I've got to say about that. Thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends. Subscribe to my channel. And you might also give me a comment in the comment box below.